Welcome to She Talk with People. I'm Nancy Barger, and our conversation today is with Ted Arn, who is the great grandson of Lewis Miller. Welcome, Ted. Well, thank you, Nancy. Before we go into some biography of who you are, I'd like to um, start out by talking about you in mm -hmm. terms that wouldn't be found in a biography. Sure. I, I've gone to a few of our uh, neighbors and friends in the old section of Chautauqua, Miller mm -hmm. Park and the grounds, mm -hmm. and this is what came up. Everyone loves Ted. Yeah. He's a strong Chautauqua presence. He's so calm, that's one of my favorite descriptors. We liked him for himself, so modest. One of the best in the neighborhood. Married a Chautauquan. He represents Miller Park growing up. Good guy to have around. So happy what happened to the house, and we'll get into that. Another neighbor, he would be the hardest working person in anything that was happening around him doing the dirtiest job, very dependable, and the ultimate Chautauquan. He always rides his bike. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Nancy. Um, your background, where did you uh, grow up? Where? Well, I, I grew up in uh, uh, Chautauqua pretty much every summer of my life, except for the two years when I was in the Navy, and then uh, East Hampton, Long Island, Colorado Springs, and Louisville, Kentucky, where where we spent the winter. And you have an interesting story to tell about your birth certificate. You were born in New Jersey, I understand. I was, I was born in New Jersey. Yeah, that was for about a couple of months that actually I was uh, brought home from the hospital to the Mrs. Edison's house in uh, West Orange, New Jersey, Glenmont. So my birth certificate says Edison on it. Edison or Glenmont? Is it uh, Edison actually is what it says. Is it, was that because, the name of a, of well, a town? Or? It was as to whose house, what the address was, was uh, uh, Glenmont Edison. and it says Edison. That's amazing. So my mother was living there at the time. My father was sick with TB, so he was out in Colorado. So Your father was out in yes, Colorado? Right, right. Well, that's a story not many people would be able to claim that. Yeah, that's true. How about your education? Well, I, I went to the University of Pittsburgh is where I graduated in natural science. A little background of computer science and, and is psychology were the two sort of majors. And uh, I certainly know your wife, but uh, why don't you mm. introduce her? Oh, Mary Boyle. She's from Oil City, and uh, they, bought, they built a house in 2000, uh, I mean, in, in uh, 1979 in Chautauqua and became very active with Chautauqua, with the family that is. Where are your children? They're in uh, Clinton, New York. One of them is in, and the other one is in New York City working at NYU uh, Business School there. Both daughters? Both daughters, yes. So. All right, so let's begin with who is Lewis Miller? Well, Lewis Miller is the, one of the co-founders of Chautauqua Institution, and he and his uh, stepbrother started a company called Altman and Miller and Company, and then Al C. Altman, where also they were both partners in that. And they uh, made farm machinery starting in about the 1860s. And the farm machinery was a sickle bar that uh, uh, was in front of the driver and it articulated. So, and it was, this was all horse drawn. And um, so that the driver, if he fell off, didn't get chopped up in the sickle bar. And so then they made that into also a reaper, a combine. So it would do a bales of hay, for instance. And uh, so that was very successful. I was just looking up the statistics on that. And in around uh, 1860, uh, uh, there were 300, and, I mean, three, 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 31 million people in the United States. And of that, 15 million were in the agriculture business. And there were two million farms. And so it was very popular. Uh, they sold uh, about 8,000 8, of these uh, mowers a year. So he, he came from Akron? Akron, Akron. Ohio, correct, yes. And, and he was friends bef at, before the Chautauqua with Vincent, Bishop Vincent, uh, they, or? He was uh, very much interested in Sunday schools, and uh, the bishop uh, came to Akron, it was the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church is what it was, and, and they were working on trying to help 
Sunday school teachers uh, be more effective and more well-rounded is when how Chautauqua sort of came to pass. And one of the things that Lewis Miller did was design a church was called the Akron Plan, which actually had a back part, which was the Sunday schools. And then the front part of the church was the typical church, but there was a big doorway right behind what would be normally called the altar, and it would uh, uh, open up so that both sides of the church could actually participate in a sa single event. And that was very popular in that particular period in 1860s and 70s, so they built a lot of those. And as a result, they wanted to fine tune the education for uh, Sunday school teachers and have them have a better, more well-rounded understanding of other religions and history and so forth. And that's when Chautauqua, the idea of going away to some place to focus on that. And so Chautauqua was morphed from that into what it is today with the religion, the arts, music, uh, literature. Recreation. Recreation, <laughs> yes. Four pillars. Well, uh, so he, he was an entrepreneur. Yes, he had very lots much of so. patents or invented yes, other did. things, right? 93 patents, uh, and he uh, uh, was uh, also involved with uh, uh, well, the castings for this, the farm machinery as well. And, and he started, uh, he was on, uh, it was a Union uh, uh, College in Alliance, Ohio. Was, he was on the board of directors there, and that was the first college in the 1860s that uh, granted uh, degrees to women and had a open curriculum. Which was, was it a co-ed totally school? Or it was, was a co-ed co school co in, in 1860. It must not be still around. Maybe. It is. It oh, is. It is? It's right, very much still around. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So he comes to Chautauqua and um, he he's married and has children. Mm -hmm. And how can you make the transition between Lewis and your well-known, uh, oh, sure. let's see, this would be your great uncle. Great uncle, yes. Uh, I'll just show you, this is a picture of the, of the cottage that we're gonna be talking a little bit about. It is, uh, was built in 1875 for the, uh, for the uh, arrival of uh, President Grant who was the, one of the first guests. Uh, uh, Bishop Vincent knew President Grant and uh, from a former church in Chicago, as I recall. And um, so uh, it was built and prefabricated in Akron, Ohio at one of the plants using the pattern lumber for the machinery. And they shipped it up here pre-cut. And so it's one, probably one of the first, if not the first, prefabricated house in the United States. Certainly on Chautauqua Tours, that's mm -hmm. the tag that often goes with that, that uh, mm -hmm. building, mm -hmm. is the prefab aspect of its construction. Right. So he comes and he builds this for, wasn't it specifically it was, for that visit? It was, it, that precipitated the construction. But he had 11 children, and so the upstairs of the house uh, was the dormitory for the girls, and, the, and they had a tent off to the side, which was the dormitory for the boys, and President Grant stayed with the boys. So that, that was uh, part of the story. And among the 11 children? One was Mina, and uh, she, at 20 years old, married Thomas Edison, and he, his first wife had died and left him with three children. And so uh, uh, anyway, they, they she uh, tapped, he tapped out the, in the Morris Code, will you marry me? And, and uh, she said yes, and so they were married. And they had three children. Uh, and one of them was uh, governor of New Jersey and undersecretary and secretary of the Navy, Charles Edison. And Theodore Edison was a, and I knew all of these people, uh, Theodore was very much a naturalist and was uh, uh, involved with preserving the Everglades and various other wasn't there some connection, you and I were someplace with Roosevelt or named after, Teddy was named after, or? Well, actually, uh, Th uh, Theodore uh, Edison was named after Mer Mina's uh, brother, Theodore, who was killed in this in charge up of San Juan Hill. That's what it was. He had graduated from Yale and uh, was all churned up by the, the, that particular Spanish-American War issue and got one of his friends, Goodyear, to go with him 
uh, and they went uh, down to Florida and prepared for going to war and went off and uh, he got shot in the back of the neck with a, a bullet and died the following night. That's the story I Yeah, I remember. and he was apparently very much of a scholar and really would have been, it was a shame that had lost such a talented young fellow. So how did your mother um, come into the building and, and caretaking it eventually? How did that well, her, transition take place? Yeah, my, my grandfather was uh, John Miller and uh, when Mina died, why well, the house went into uh, Mina's So, so John estate. was one of Lewis's children? Children, exactly. Yes. okay. And so Mina, uh, when she died, uh, that uh, was in the estate, and so my mother basically bought it from the estate in 1951. And she had come here as, mm -hmm, a, as a child. As a child, and because her parents had died when she was a teenager? Yes, or? the chronology is that Edison died in 1931, and my mother was around uh, eight years old at the time, and so when Mrs. Edison wanted a companion, and so she came and lived with Mrs. Edison, until she was, you know, going to college in Radcliffe, she would come to Chautauqua every summer from that age, and so we always lived in this house. And so she became very attached to that house. And uh, That house has been well taken care of, hence she, I, I think uh, everyone is so pleased that it's now in a new chapter of its life. Uh, your mother, I remember something about her that I, I don't often see. Within the artifacts that were mm -hmm. in here, after she died, I believe, or even maybe beforehand too, her notebook of her sketches that Nancy oh. Arn did at the back when she would sit at the amphitheater. I mean, she right. was talented. And yeah, she, she documented was. all these programs that she went to. I, I will never forget that. And yeah. I'm sure it's among some of the things that I'm sure are being that are kept. There. The one thing a lot of people don't realize that is about 90% of the furniture furnishings and the books on the shelves were all original from when Mrs. Edison had it. Mother was very uh, uh, adamant about keeping everything uh, the same, I mean upgrading it and replacing it, but always with the same type of material, the upholstery for the couches and so forth in there, uh, managed to get those once again uh, because they were available, that we had to get them from London. And unfortunately, the last time around, they weren't available, that particular p pattern, so. I remember in the kitchen, uh, mm -hmm. the Birch and Garden Club, a little white and green trim dishes. Mm -hmm. What are some examples of other artifacts that you well, when remember that are there? Mrs. Edison had an inventory done in 1930, uh, 1925, I should say. And uh, on that inventory, when we were, uh, turning the house over to the institution, we literally went through everything, and including all the books. The bo all the books are catalog cataloged and in the database, and there's about 398 books that were all original there. And so this inventory in 1925 had the books in it, so we used that as a basis for, and it became apparent that it was really kind of a lending library because you know there wasn't TV and even radios and so forth in that time. And Mrs. Edison was a prolific writer. She must have written maybe uh, you know four to five, six letters a day because uh, we we collected from my cousin Theodore when he died. There were about 1,500 letters uh, to to him from Mrs. Edison, and that was only a fraction of the of the letters. So it was pretty fascinating. I think the Edison Cottage is as close as we come on the grounds to a museum. That's. Because the archives are, 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 are have many historic uh, papers in them, but this this would be as close as we have as a museum. Would you agree? Uh, the one, the one, yes, absolutely. The one thing that is um, unique about this building is that of the, the amount of contents are original, and ninety percent, as I mentioned. And Glenmont, which is the Edison's home in New Jersey, is a similar because Aunt, uh, uh, Mina uh, cousin when she died, Cousin Charles gave Glenmont to the National Park Service, lock, stock, and barrel, down to all the dishes and plates and everything. And uh, uh, then Mina, before she died, uh, gave uh, uh, the house down in Fort Myers, which is called Seminole Lodge, to the city of, uh, of Fort Myers. And so it is all original. So of some famous person in the United States, 
to have three of the houses that they lived in that are pretty much all original is pretty unusual. That, that is unusual, and I'm sure some of the people watching this have been to those, those uh, other places. Those yes. other places. Um, tell me a little bit more about the descendants of these you know, integral people at Chautauqua. I, you have some cousins who are around, I think. Yes, my cousin Dick Miller, who used to be the chairman of the board and the, and the foundation, and he did a marvelous job with he Chautauqua sure did. in that time frame. Yeah. And uh, is dedicated to Chautauqua. And your sister? sister? My sister Kim will be here this coming weekend. Okay. And she'll be here for the rest of the season. And she's a longtime Chautauqua kid. And my other sister, Mina, unfortunately died in tragic circumstances. And she was always here taking care of the cottage she as well. She sure was. I remember Both Mina sweeping that front walkway <laughs> every day. Yes. Faithfully. Yeah. Faithfully. Yes, she would. So, so we're entering this. Um, new ownership mm -hmm. of the the cottage and how did that come about and I, I I'm sure for years many Chautauquans were hoping something like this would, mm -hmm. would happen and the burden of being the caretaker wouldn't be all yours well, what happened well uh, uh, Tom Hagen came forward he wanted to take a look at the house and so I gave him a tour of the house one time after the season and he was um, he was amazed at how much of the house was all original and that's what uh, I guess uh, encouraged him to give it to Chautauqua, it was, which, which was an absolute mar marvelous gift. For, and Tom, a, for, a former economic development director of Pennsylvania, right, right. an Erie um, resident, prominent mm -hmm. citizen who, with his wife, had done yeah, many. Susie, oh yeah, they've done some wonderful things for some Chautauqua. Some wonderful things. And what are the and, plans, or what's been executed so far with his plans? Well, they last year they had a fundraiser which to raise money to redo the garden, which is a significant garden because it was done by a, a lady uh, landscape architect, Ellen Biddle Shipman, and she did uh, houses for the Astors, the, the Vanderbilts, and uh, her mentor was uh, Olmsted, who was the one who uh, designed Frederick Central, Olmsted. yeah, Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central Park. And so she was, uh, 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 did a beautiful job and it was in 1922 is when she came up with the design uh, and those documents are all at the Chautauqua archives. And, uh, and then Mrs. Edison, of course, wasn't a wilting violet being a president of the Bird Tree and Garden Club. So just because Ellen Biddle Shipman decided that the garden should have this plant here and that. So I think she probably adjusted a few things knowing, <laughs> <laughs> knowing her. And um, so as a result, we even have the bills from when they uh, originally, uh, the original planting bills, so that uh, uh, Betsy from the Chautauqua Institution, marvelous green lady, had th that documentation as far as restoring the garden. And Ed Ellen Biddle Shipman's archives are actually in uh, Cornell University's archives. Yeah, I remember the presentation about what a strong, um, woman she was, and, mm -hmm. and Mina, in her own right, uh, working with somebody like this. And what, what's entailed? I think some people were a bit shocked uh, when they saw some of the landscaping that had been there that had grown Gone, up through the yes. years, and it, all of a sudden it had disappeared. What, what, I, well, what, and there are some pictures of it when it was in 1922, when it was com first done, and it, and it probably is more open then than it is now because I think a lot of the, the planning was Ellen Biddle Shipman's plan, which is which what they're implementing. And um, because the way we had it, we had it pretty private. People didn't even know that there was the garden back there because it was behind a hedge of hemlocks. And uh, it was uh, pretty pretty private. So now it's, it's more public, but it is pretty. It's, for, it's nice to have, see all sides of the house because it was designed as sort of a Swiss chalet. Uh, it's a, uh, what they call a, a stick uh, construction from that particular period of time. What do you think will happen going forward and in use of the building? I think it'll just light use tours and then maybe a residence for uh, one or two people is what I sort of See, I mean, the Bishop uh, Robinson, who was an interviewee here 
a couple weeks oh, ago. Oh, that's right. Yes. He stayed and there, so right? So he's staying there, and so he's enjoying the house. and So it's nice to see that. For those people who may not know exactly where it is on the grounds, can you give a little description? Uh, it is uh, on, on Miller Park, uh, down near the bell tower, if you will. If you were at the bell tower and walked away from the lake towards going up the hill on Vincent Avenue, you'll see it on the left. It's gray uh, with turquoise trim, and it's always been gray with turquoise trim. And we've it sure had, has. To, had to fight the battle to get uh, have it. Have Stay a custom made, uh, oh. custom made the paint, and that was before the days of now, where you can easily get the custom made paint, because uh, it was PPG's, uh, uh, I forget what it was, Peacock Blue or something, and uh, we had to always get that formula made because uh, they discontinued it. So. I remember your sister one year made a. As, to keep my gate pass, many mm -hmm. people have these lanyards, and she made one in boondoggled in uh, this the gray and turquoise, so, turquoise. And, and I have it to this day, yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's, that's great. I think you wanted to talk a little bit about how people would find out more about Lewis Miller oh, outside sure. of these 28 sure. minutes of our sure. conversation. Yeah, there, there's a book uh, about Lewis Miller uh, and it is titled Lewis Miller, and it's and it is written by uh, Hendrix, and uh, it's a, you can find it uh, by going to Amazon, and you can get a copy. Or uh, is it an old book? It's an old oh, book. An it old was book. it was written I think in uh, about uh, 1935 or something like that. Uh, so that it was a it's, it's a good little book, and then of course looking it up and it's a biography. Uh, biography, correct. And by looking it up in Wikipedia, you'll see the credits for the, the other biographies that are there. One of them being a small booklet that was done about Theodore Miller, the Rough Rider. And uh, you can actually get a copy of that uh, through the Harvard University Press. And they custom print them. Uh, but so if somebody goes to the Oliver Archives... Or, mm -hmm. or, they would have a copy to take a look at. They would have a copy at. there. And the Chautauqua Library would also have copies of both of those. What's it like to be a, a descendant of these famous people? I mean, well, it's it's a little uh, trying to live up to this is a, is a, with all the accomplishments that they all made. I mean, cousin Charles was the head of uh, Thomas A. Edison Incorporated, and then they merged with McGraw Edison. He was the chairman of the board of McGraw Edison, for instance, and and my cousin Theodore. Why, of course, he was all uh, off into uh, the uh, nature and was involved with the Everglades and, and the Nature Conservancy. He was one of the co-founders of that, although he never wanted to take any credit for anything. He, he, they, were, they were sort of polar opposites. And then my Aunt Madeline, she was always very, very active with the Red Cross as far as that particular side of the family. And mine had something to do with saving the Athenaeum through... Yes, she did. Uh, during the Depression, she... Uh, 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 essentially bought the bonds for the Athenaeum Hotel, about $100,000 worth of bonds. And so she did uh, uh, save the institution uh, for that, kept the, kept the hotel as part of the institution. What else have we not covered? There's so much in history we could talk about any, uh, t take any tangents we want to. Um, I mean, I think we covered that your, your mother uh, and your sisters certainly, mm -hmm. and all of you took care mm -hmm. of it. I, I mean, to me, oh, Ted, yes. you are uh, the person who always, anything that needed to be done in Miller Park, you had a toolkit <laughs> and you knew exactly <laughs> where it, the right yeah. tool was to fix it. And well, that's, that was one of the, the keys to trying to keep the place going was, was uh, the maintenance of the it, maintenance, obviously. The maintenance, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so we, we, when I was in England one time, I found a book about uh, uh, taking care of historic homes, and that was really a fascinating book and to, to use it to try to keep things. Uh. And Miller Park, of course, being really the original mm -hmm. um, platform for Chautauqua, where the mm -hmm. stump was and speakers, right. and uh, to this day, people are maintaining uh, the integrity mm -hmm. in, in of the architecture, of the architecture yes. right there facing the park. And yes, we, we had some of them. The railings remilled, and and uh, some of the boards in that house are you know different thickness. So I had those all 
custom made and had some extras that are in the shed in the building. So we had to try to keep it all original and ward off any potential problems in advance. And no problems that now you and Mary live uh, outside of Miller Park. But in, a, in a more modern building. In a yes. more modern <laughs> building, yes. So, so, but it is nice to see Chautauqua have it and it'll be, it'll be fun for people to see as, they, as time goes on. Absolutely. What do, what do you enjoy doing? I, I recall um, actually in talking with our acquaintances um, that you had for years crewed on uh, Bob Wilder's uh, oh, lightning. Was it lightning? Lightning. lightning. <coughs> and then Bob Eckhart's uh, uh, Flying Scott. So yes, yeah, sailing was a big part of But and I didn't too. remember that you had been a Council, uh, a sailing instructor. Yes, I had for I one forgot year. that. I mm -hmm. knew you. I one of the best jobs I ever had. I think a lot of people <laughs> could say that. <laughs> yes, it was great. And what else have you done around the grounds? What, what do you enjoy yourself personally? Well, the lectures and the, and the symphony, and like the youth symphony tonight, will be fun to see what they have to say and yeah. just play. Yeah. So that's good. And where do you live when you're not uh, on the grounds? In, in Pittsburgh. And uh, so we stay there and come up here on weekends sometimes in the winter. So it's, it's, it's a nice commute. It's not too As far. As it's becoming more of a year-round place. It is. Uh, it is. Place more and more. You're in a winterized. Mm -hmm. I remember, a winterized house, I yes. remember going to a Halloween party in this cottage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do, do you remember we did that. that? Oh, we did that. Yes, we had a good Halloween party. It was probably one of the best dress-up parties I ever saw. That was a great time, uh, and still the, the facility survived. It did it, survive, When I yes. look back at it, I think, how did it survive? How did you invite all those people <laughs> and <laughs> not worry about the... Uh, yes, I think there was 30 or 40 people in that living room. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was a lot of fun. And then everybody was so inventive about... Uh, and then we also would have... Uh, in, May would roll around and we'd have a derby party and everybody would all get all dressed up. And, that's right, your Kentucky make background make juleps. of making juleps. Yes, we would. Juleps. We'd make juleps. The, the, all the original way even had some silver cups. Yeah. Some people were lucky enough to get the silver ones and some people got the plastic silver You ones. have honored the Edison Cottage uh, over and over and it's my real pleasure to have you uh, as a guest on Chautauqua People. Thank you very well, much. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. It's been fun.